Hey, everybody. We are so excited for this week. Um, I mean, I suppose it's going to be a fishy week <laughs> because I think by now, people who've listened to the Brain Warriors Way podcast know that fish are brain food. Right. We and love fish. fish are good for your brain. And we just couldn't think of anybody better to come on and talk about it than a fisherman who is a graduate of MIT, who grew up loving fishing and has made a significant business doing this. So Jeff, Ted Mori is with us. Uh, hey, Jeff. Now, in full disclosure, Jeff is my nephew <laughs> who, and yes, people go, you guys look alike. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's a little obvious. If you didn't say that, I was <laughs> then it really would be fishy. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but it's super interesting because he's always grown up fishing, and this kid's super smart. Obviously, goes to MIT, um, and then makes a business out of doing the thing he loves most, which is fishing. So that's just super cool. So welcome, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Good to see you both. You so too. tell us your journey. You know, I think in this first episode, let's let people get to know you. So um, obviously you grow up in our family, which is large and a bit insane. You're, it's an amazing family. Your dad is an incredible cook. He grew up in Lebanon. And I remember one of the stories from your dad. He didn't do well in school. And he said out of 45 kids, they didn't give you grades. They ranked you mm -hmm. on how you were in the class. And so of the 45 kids, I was 44. And his dad got mad at him because, well, if you're going to be the worst, why don't you be <laughs> the worst? <laughs> but you did really well in school. So that's super interesting. No, I love that. Um, so talk to us about growing up fishing and how you ended up at MIT. Yeah. I, so for me, I grew up in a family that really wasn't a huge fan of the ocean. So it's kind of weird that I wound up with this insane passion for something where really my dad, my mom, all of my siblings, none of them had a deep passion for fishing or the ocean. But I always oh, recall- your dad did. So your dad didn't. No, no. Okay. So my dad, my dad would always go fishing with me. Uh, because my mom wouldn't let me go on a boat with a bunch of like old guys going fishing uh, without him. And so what was amazing was that he would go on all of these fishing trips with me purely because he just wanted to spend time with me. And so for me, from a very early age, it started with scuba diving when we would go on family vacations. Uh, right. I was I was the kid that was going up to the scuba diving instructor and having to convince him that I was old enough and that my asthma is not really that much of a big <laughs> deal, right? Like nobody would let a 13 year old go scuba diving who has asthma. Um, but I was able to convince my way in purely because I was extremely passionate about it and wanted to make it happen. So that passion turned into a deep passion for fishing, which turned into a deep passion for sailing where I was a high school and collegiate sailor, which turned into a passion for surf. and say that like, I'm truly an ocean hobbyist. And my whole life, I've always viewed the ocean as this place where I can just mentally reset, relax, and like all worries go away when I'm in the ocean. And so I, what, what I quickly found is that if I'm going to be doing something for the rest of my life, why not find a way to connect that passion that I have for the ocean with what I do for a career and what I do for a living. And so ultimately I, I left the job that I had prior, um, went to business school at MIT with the, with the true like mission to use business to preserve our world's oceans. And, and ultimately it's because I saw the profound impact it had had on my life. And I had seen, you know, kind of, the degradation and destruction that we've seen in the ocean, whether it's through pollution, through overfishing, through you know so many different means that I wanted to make sure that future generations had that same environment to grow up in like I had. And it was at MIT that I, I quickly learned that, you know, that there were some issues within the seafood supply chain that could be fixed. And 
that's where I connected the dots that I could do, you know, what, whatever my job is and, and could connect it with that passion for the ocean I have. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm listening to Jeff Bezos's book, Invent and Wonder, which I highly recommend. It's really a good book. And Amazon has bought many companies. And he says when he talks to the founders, he's looking to see if they're missionaries or mercenaries. Mm, and he only buys companies where the founders are missionaries. And he says, oh, by the way, missionaries make more money because they're in it because they love it and they want to protect the business and make it grow as opposed to being in it just for money. Right. And clearly at Amon Clinics, we're missionaries mm -hmm. and have loved it for a long time. Um, what did your family think about you going into this business? Did it just sort of make sense to them, given your love and your passion? Although you had a good job. You were working at Patagonia before you went to MIT, and they loved you there. They wanted to keep you. Yeah, no, I mean, it, was, it wasn't an easy decision, right? I had an amazing job at an incredible company surrounded by amazing people where I was sitting alongside one of the greatest entrepreneurs of all time, like sitting right next to me, the founder of Patagonia. And I would have conversations with him about his excursions going fishing or diving and uh, growing up in, in Southern California. And I was, I was sitting on their, their corporate investment arm. So I would, I would vet early stage mission driven startups. And a lot of them are related to the oceans or the apparel supply chain and sustainability. Um, but what I found was that talking with entrepreneurs on a daily basis made me envious of that side of the table, right? I had this deep hunger and it's in my blood to be yeah. an entrepreneur, right? My grandfather, your dad, um, Daniel, um, right, started his own thing, right? And that's, that's just inherent in who I am. And that's, that's ultimately why I left was because I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to take that risk. Um, Although never in a million years would I think I would end up in the same industry that my that like my family comes from, right? Because all growing up, um, the question was always, "Are you going to join the family business?" And it was always no, right? There's no way I'm going to join the family <laughs> business. Um, and what's so funny is that um, you know, growing up in a family of grocers, they've always been feeding people. And now I'm doing that exact same thing, but with a very specific product that I that I know and love really well. You know, I've had conversations with you, and what I what I really discovered when I first heard you were doing fishing, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. He loves fishing, but I really realized for you it was about way more than that. Um, you, when I've when I've talked to you about this, it's like you have a deep passion for the fishermen. You have a deep passion for the ocean, for sustainability, and for you, like I, I realized you were trying to bring all of that together. Like you were really trying to take care of these guys and the ocean. And, um, and that was really cool. Like you, you, your passion runs deep and really it's comprehensive. And I like that. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where the fishing community has been, has just been pushed aside in a way, right? They yeah. take their products as commodities. They pay them the lowest prices possible and and that's it, right? And we've lost a lot of that love in the food that we eat. Right? Yeah, we've lost that a little like farmers, right? Would you compare it to farming? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so having that deep connection with your fishermen is is largely lost. And so I really wanted to set out on this mission where we could actually pay fishermen a living wage, pay them more than anybody else is willing to pay them and prove out the hypothesis that if you do that, they'll take better care of the product and our customers are going to get a higher quality product at the end of the day. And, you know, I strongly believe that, you know, if you, if you treat people right and with respect and you take care of them, then, then they'll do right. Um, and, and ultimately put out a, a, a better product at the end of the day. Well, it's that passion for your customers and your customers are both fishermen and then the, people who consume it. When we come back, let's talk about eFish. So if people want to learn about 
um, how to get this really high quality, sustainable fish. Um, they go to efish.com. Is that your website? That's correct. E-fish.com. So there's a hyphen in between. And you can use the discount code Amen 10 for 10% off your, your first purchase um, of fresh American sustainable seafood. Awesome. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are here with Jeffrey Ted Mori, who is our nephew, and um, just really enjoying this talk about why he's so passionate about starting this business, fishing. Um, we love fish; it's good for the brain, and he loves fishing and the ocean and fishermen. And um, this is really cool. I love this because Jeffrey is a really smart kid. I mean, we always knew he was a really smart kid. Went to MIT, um, so that's not an easy feat. And then when he decided to open a fishing business, I think we were all like, "Oh." I mean, for me, I knew instantly, I'm like, I know Jeffrey's going to do something different with it. I didn't think, oh, why is he doing this? I thought, oh, what is he going to do that's different? Because that's just Jeffrey. Well, right. and why we wanted him on the Brand Warriors Way podcast, there's a very clear correlation between people who have grilled or baked fish every week and the level of gray matter in their brain. So one of our friends, Cyrus Raji, published a study uh, this is really important, right? The food you eat directly impacts the health or illness of your brain, which means how you think, your overall level of success, your uh, ability to connect and relate. And one thing I like is this, I mean, obviously eFish sort of speaks for itself. During quarantine, when we couldn't get food, I was like, Okay, I can. I mean, we had to order stuff, right? But it was easy. I got. I just ordered fish online. So and it was, e dash fish. Yeah. Dot com. So all right, Jeff, tell us how. T tell us about e fish and all of the Brain Warrior listeners. Yeah. So e fish is a seafood marketplace connecting at home discerning cooks to independent seafood wholesalers. So we have a vast network of fishermen spread throughout the entire country. So they're in Maine, Massachusetts, Florida, up and down the, the California coastline, and they ship to any customer in the lower 48 states. So whether you're in Wisconsin or Ohio, New York or California, you can have access to fresh, wild American sources of seafood. But the biggest difference for us is not just the, the unique items that we sell, but more about the process for how all of this ordering takes place. Right? We don't have a warehouse full of frozen fish that's waiting to be sold. Actually, in a lot of cases, the fish is still swimming at the time our customers place the order. Right, We then have these relationships with the fishermen where they go fish, catch the product, and once they land, it gets put into a package with ice cold gel packs and shipped overnight to our customers. So they're receiving this fresh, most of the time never frozen seafood item that has only been out of water for less than 48 hours, which is just an unparalleled quality. And you can get unique items that you wouldn't find elsewhere, whether it's fresh anchovies and mackerel, or if it's live spot prawns. Of course, we do have staples like halibut or California halibut, California king salmon when it's in season. But what's important is that we're trying to educate customers to learn when certain items are in season very similar to produce at a farmer's market. Um, we're trying to get customers a bit better educated as far as what's in season and what's not. And is all of this fish 
wild or is some of it farmed? Yeah, so that's a really common question. And the answer really is it depends. Um, here's, here's the caveat, right? So um, there's, there's always this trade-off between wild and farm-raised. And not in all cases is a farm-raised product considered bad. When it comes to shellfish, it's a really good thing for people and for the environment that they're in, right? So oyster farms are, you know, have a really strong reputation because they're constantly filtering water that they're within. And so the estuaries and the areas that people grow oysters, um, they actually give back to the environment that they're in, right? Compared to you know, some other farms, whether it's a fin fish farm in, you know, uh, somewhere other than the U.S. where, you know, it's highly concentrated and then there can be a lot of added chemicals into the mix and disease and things like that, which are not good. Um, but when it comes to shellfish, we strongly recommend people consuming farm-raised shellfish, whether it's oysters, mussels, clams, all of that is great as a bivalve. Um, and, but most of the, the fin fish that we sell are going to be wild caught. Um, we do have one fin fish that, that we sell that is a farm raised product. And that's actually farmed, uh, here in California. It's a mountain lass and trout. Um, and really we're, we're really picky when it comes to the farms we choose to work with, right? We go to the farm, we visit them, we see what the operation looks like. Cause we want to make sure that there's no issues with social welfare. These fish are getting treated properly, um, uh, being fed organic feedstock, not stuff that's, um, that's not good for, for the body. Um, but for the most part, we launched with really trying to support these wild harvesters of seafood. Um, I'm a fan of the app seafoodwatch.org and uh, it tells you, it's from the Monterey Bay Aquarium and tells you, you know, basically eat this, don't eat that. And they actually list a number of farm raised Yeah, that surprised fish. me. And then as I looked into it, it's like, well, you have to go deeper. And yeah. one of the questions, just like you just mentioned, is what do they feed the fish? Because whatever an animal eats, well, you get to eat it too, right? So you're consuming it as well. Um, and also and so how wild, they're raising depending on where it is, there are parts of the ocean that are actually exactly. not very healthy. Uh, and that's what I learned. I, I used to think it was only wild fish. And then I realized, oh, sometimes wild is not as healthy. Some of these farms are actually now, they're saying, because they're now learning how to, to raise the fish and feed the fish. And they're actually starting to become healthy and sustainable. And I was like, oh, interesting. So seafoodwatch.org is good for that too. Yeah. And, and the way that I tend to think about it is I typically go wild first when I have a product that's that's truly in season, right? So when I think of, of buying fish, it's very similar to buying fresh produce, right? Are you going to buy the, you know, the a frozen corn versus a fresh corn? Well, it depends on if corn's in season or not. Right. If corn's in season, then fresh corn that you're going to throw in the barbecue that hasn't been husked is going to be delicious and sweet and great. But when it's not in season, that frozen product's going to be really good, right? So it's hard to compare sometimes, but That's you have to prioritize each of these. Right. So when our listeners go into the store, what are the things they should be thinking about? I mean, we really want them to be thinking fish, you know, actually this would be a good phrase for Jeff fish first. <laughs> we often say brain first, yeah. right? Cause that's our business. But when it comes to brain health, and you think of all the different types of protein people can consume, fish first would be a good way to think about it because fish is loaded mm -hmm. with omega-3 fatty acids compared to lamb or turkey, chicken or beef. Mm -hmm. And that makes up a significant percentage of the nerve cell membranes in your brain. And we found, it's crazy, Jeff, that we did a study looking at the level of omega-3 fatty acids in your blood on 50 consecutive patients, Damon Clinics, who were not taking fish oil. 49 of them had suboptimal levels. 
And the CDC actually uh, put out a study saying that 97% of the population is low in omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids, when it's low, you have a higher incidence of depression, a higher incidence of dementia. You have more inflammation in your body. You're more likely to have an autoimmune disorder. I mean, it's just associated with, you know, your heart and your eyes mm-hmm. and your skin and your hair. That's not my problem. I inherited it. But um, so if we go with I, this idea of fish first, how should people shop for fish? Yeah. And, and I love that that fish first idea. And one, one thing that you made me just think about as well, I was reading a, the USDA dietary guidelines report where they also said that 90% of Americans don't eat the recommended amount of seafood. And so hearing you say that 97% are low in in those fatty acids. It, it feels like a, a really direct a really direct tie there. Um, but as far as what to look for when you're when you're shopping for seafood, first and foremost, um, I like to just ask questions, right? And you quickly learn whether the person, whether it's behind the counter, if it's a fish market, if it's a your local fishmonger, if it's a grocery store, getting answers. And how they respond to those answers is a really easy way to know whether that company you're buying from actually cares about a lot of these uh, a, a lot of these questions, right? Whether they're digging into it on the sourcing side or not. And so, where I typically start is first and foremost, uh, a USA caught and processed product is really going to alleviate a lot of issues regarding overfishing. Uh, within within the area because the USA is the most highly regulated fishery in the world. Um, so that's going to alleviate a lot of environmental issues that you may have, um, as well as social issues, right? Because we have labor laws here in the US that are extremely stringent that these fishermen have to abide by. Um, so first and foremost, USA caught. Um, the next thing is, is, of course, whether or not it's wild or not. If it's farm raised, you want to figure out where it's where that farm is right? You want to dig in a little bit deeper. And I know that's a lot of work. And so if you can find somebody that you trust to make those decisions, to find the right, uh, to source from the right farms for you, then that's the easiest thing to do. But ask questions. Um, And ultimately, when it comes to taste, um, I like to think that a fresh product is going to be, is going to, a fresh in-season product is going to outperform a frozen one. Um, But there's a lot of really amazing freezing technology where they really are able to freeze at, um, you know, at a really deep level of freshness. But if you can work with somebody who gets you products super fast, then, um, you know, I typically go with that fresh product. So you made me think of Chilean sea bass and Scottish salmon and Norwegian anchovies. Yep. And are, are those marketing ploys or... Are they actually from those areas? Yeah. No, I mean, in in a lot of cases, they are, right? So Chilean sea bass is a great example of that. It sounds exotic. It tastes great. Um, But there are areas of the world that are that are better known for responsible fishing than others. And it takes a a, a bit of digging to figure out where those areas are, right? We sell uh, products out of out of Scotland that come from the Scottish Fishermen's Union. Um, it's a small co-op of fishermen who who operate out of Scotland, and they're catching uh, scallops, small haddock, squid, cuttlefish, all these amazing products. But we know that we that we trust them because we've been there. We've seen the size of their vessels. We see the gear types that they use. Um, and we don't expect the average customer or the average consumer of seafood to do that digging. That's a lot of research. Right. Um, and it's it's not as simple as looking at the you know, seeing Chilean sea bass and saying, is Chile good or bad? It's, it's really not that simple, right? You have to dig a little bit deeper into it. Mm. Awesome. Uh, when we come back, I want you to tell us some of the stories you've heard because businesses really grow on stories of how your work is impacting people's lives. Yeah, People can learn about uh, your company at e-fish.com. I love that you have that URL. That's a great URL. Um, Stay with us.
welcome back. We are here with Jeff Ted Mori. We're talking about fish in your brain and how to have a bigger brain. It's the only organ where size matters. And if you want a bigger brain, fish has just got to be part of your diet. Um, some people say, I don't like fish. Uh, and um, I wonder why that happens. Do you have any idea? It's, you know, their mom was not a good cook and didn't prepare it right. They weren't exposed to it young. Um, when Chloe, our youngest, was oh, she would eat. a child, she would eat was a no small child. Protein. No, like six months old. Like she was like six months old. She always would reach for my for sushi. And I'm like, she can't eat that because I'm not going to give a six month old raw fish. So I called her doctor. She wouldn't eat any protein though. So I called her doctor. Finally, when she's about a year old, she wouldn't eat any kind of chicken, nothing. Not She wouldn't even eat hot dogs. Like I would like try to bribe her with some kind of protein because I was like freaked out that she wouldn't eat protein. So I called her doctor. He's like, give her the sushi. Just make sure it's clean. And I was like, really? So, but she was drawn. Why she had 12 word sentences? Maybe. And why she tortures me <laughs> with language? Yeah, no, she's like, yeah, maybe that's why she's got a 4.2 GPA. Who knows? Yeah. But all she would eat was raw fish. It was the, she wouldn't even eat it if it was cooked. Yeah. Super yeah. weird. What's funny is I grew up hating seafood. Oh, funny. I, I would not eat it. Um, and, and I had this interesting situation where I love to go fishing. And so I came back after a fishing trip with, with like all of this incredible fish and I would give it away to family members. I would give it away to friends and family. And my parents sat me down and said, listen, if you're going to go fishing, you have to eat the fish. Oh, that's you funny. Can't, you can't kill these, these animals and not consume them. That's just not right. And so that next fishing trip I went on, I, I made a dedicated effort to, to try it when I got home. And I was shocked. Like it, it tasted nothing like what I had always known fish to be. And that's because I had grown up never actually having a good piece of fish. Interesting. Right? So I think at the end of the day, people have bad experiences because they're not getting a fish that's truly fresh. Yeah. They're out of water for far too many weeks. Yeah. Uh, they're frozen and thawed out far too many times. And, you know, what we like to say is that the quality of seafood depends on two things. It's time out of water and consistent temperature. And the traditional supply chain relies on three to five different wholesalers moving the product between warehouses. And that extends time and it increases the risk that that product's going to stay cold. Yeah. And that leads to a product that's ultimately subpar. And so I would encourage anybody who does claim that, you know, it's too fishy or I don't like it. Try a good piece of fish and you might be surprised. That's cute. So my, my neighbor was from Japan. Amazing, amazing person. He was just, he loved my daughter. He knew that she liked fish. And so he, um, he went fishing, got this very, very fresh piece of fish, brought it over. He didn't speak great English. He brought it over and he said, make sure you, I understood, make sure you eat it soon. And so I'm like, okay. So that night I cooked it and we took him a big piece of it. And he was horrified. He was horrified. Because he's like, no, you don't cook this. You eat it raw. It was like, oh, it was really cute because it was so fresh. He's like, this is sushi grade fish. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. And that's what I think. It was yellowtail. Yeah. Yeah. It was so great. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people get overwhelmed by what to do with it, right? Do I yeah. cook it? Do I eat it raw? Can I eat it raw? Right. And I like to say that when you're working with a fresh product, like truly fresh, like as if you're, like you went fishing and caught it yourself. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of prep work. It doesn't no. take a crazy recipe. If you're going to cook it, salt, pepper, and nice simple. Oil, that's all you need. Keep it yeah. simple. And you'll yeah, that's how Bear Flag made their salt, business. Salt, pepper, and I missed the last thing you said, Jeff. Just like a, a nice oil, like whether that's going to be a nice olive oil or just a finishing oil. Simple. Yeah. No, I like it. Simple. Yeah. Simple. Right. Salt, pepper. Um, completely happy with it. Maybe a little lemon juice Don't overdo uh, it. on it. Yeah. When people do too much, it can, um, sour it mm -hmm. for them. Um, story. You have any great stories since starting e fish? Yeah. So we, we had originally launched as a, 
as a marketplace connecting uh, these fishermen to fine dining chefs. Mm. And we had this elaborate plan right in place. I was, I was building this out during my second year at MIT, uh, you know, about to graduate. And we had this plan to launch March 1, 2020. And we were shipping to Jean George's restaurant in New York City. We were so excited about this launch. Two weeks in, pandemic hits. New York City is the epicenter of, uh, of the COVID. Oh, that's so painful. And so literally two weeks in, once it shut down. And what most people don't realize is how badly it also affects downstream, right? We heard from farmers, we heard from restaurant owners and chefs, but what people don't realize is that these fishermen were really heavily impacted. And so what we did uh, was, you know, I remember it distinctly. It was, it was March 18th and my fishermen uh, out of Cape Cod called me and said, Hey, all of our restaurants closed down. Uh, so we're pulling the boats out of the water and we're going to wait this thing out. Um, so I'll call you once, once, you know, this is done in a few weeks and we'll, we'll get back up and running. And I'm of course at MIT and I'm, I'm, I'm a, a student in a, in a class where, you know, literally a, um, like an epidemiologist as well as like like people who model epidemics, like these are the classes that I'm in and we're modeling this thing out in real time. And we're clearly seeing that there is no end in sight, like no matter which way we go about it. And so I went back to the fishermen and I said, listen, like if you wait this out, this is going to be really bad. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to go start knocking on doors and we're going to keep moving your product. And so that week I sent messages out to all of the students at MIT, students at Harvard Business School. And I said, hey, we've got oysters, we've got mussels. You guys are stuck indoors. I'm gonna teach you how to shock them, how to cook them. By the way, I had never cooked a mussel in my life. <laughs> and we're just, gonna, we're just gonna figure this out. And so I drove down to Cape Cod, I picked up oysters, I picked up mussels and clams. Brilliant. And, and delivered these boxes. And that's where we started this entire direct to consumer model. That's brilliant. To look back from yeah, there. People still had to eat and we were struggling. And that was just right. brilliant because it's like, what, what are we going to do? Wait a year and a half to like buy seafood? We can't do that. Right. And what's amazing is that that fisherman never had to pull their boat out of the water for the rest of that season. Right. We kept them going. That's amazing. Of course, it wasn't what it, what a normal year would look like by any stretch of the imagination, but they were still harvesting. They were still moving forward. Um, and still able to have a positive outlook on on what's going on rather than just sitting and waiting. Wow. And did your business model then change to a direct-to-consumer model, or do you see it going back to selling to restaurants or both? Yeah, so we had to we had to make a pivot to direct to consumer. Um, there were no restaurants um, that were operating. Obviously, there was uh, there was takeout but I don't know the last time that you ordered oysters for takeout or any seafood I item for takeout. It's just not that not the same of an item for takeout. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we moved to direct consumer and we love that side of the business. I will say that we do, we're starting to see these restaurants come back, right? And whether we're shipping to, uh, you know, three Michelin star Manresa in mm -hmm. the San Francisco area, John George's New York city and, and their restaurants out there. Um, like these are the restaurants that are coming back that are ordering the exact same product that we ship to our customers. It's and amazing. so we definitely see in the long term us being able to, to work with both of these customers. I love that you took care of Although those guys. Although the markup, uh, you know, if you learn how to cook this at home, oh, given the restaurant yeah. markup, uh, it's, what, like it's $45 probably, a plate in some of these places. <laughs> it's like crazy. Right. That it's a better value. And you don't, it doesn't have to be complicated. Now, let's be clear. It's fun to go to these restaurants sometimes. And, I, and I'm a huge yeah. advocate of keeping restaurants in business. So sometimes I'll do it just because I'm, I'm just so sad that some of my favorite restaurants went out of business. So I am an advocate of also keeping restaurants in business. But, but so not everyone can afford to do that. And we need to be conscious of that. And I love that we've got to well, try to people eat healthy on and budget, afford it. On right. 
afford high quality Absolutely. fish. It's so much more affordable if you do it at home. Right. Absolutely. And and, and we, I think that's one of the big benefits. And we purchase your pandemic. product and it's excellent. So yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we're gonna talk more about how fish can make you smarter. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are here with Jeffrey Ted Mori talking about fish and we're having such a good time. The stories during COVID and just, you know, how this kid from MIT made this business out of fishing has taken care of fishermen, has taken care of consumers and, you know, is really paying attention to the environment and, you know, um, sustainable, um, sustainably raised um products. And I love this. I just, I love how you put this model together. But in this episode, we want to talk about fish and the brain. Why, as far as protein goes, fish is probably your best choice. So let's talk about well, the brain. And if you go to e-fish.com, uh, you can enter in a promo code. Is it Amen 10? Yeah, Amen 10. Amen 10. And that will get you 10% off your order. So And this is truly really a great product. It. So I mean I can say that personally. So clean, healthy, delicious, good for your brain. Right? We often talk about you only want to love food that loves you back. That, you know, all of us, maybe not Jeff, because he's been with his sweetheart forever. Uh but you and I certainly have been in bad relationships. And uh, I'm not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I love somebody who loves me back. Yeah, he's looking at us like I have no idea what you're talking about because they were high school sweethearts. Right. So. But <laughs> so many people are in a bad relationship with food. They love things that hurt them, that cause inflammation, that increase their risk of cancer and diabetes and heart disease. And uh, you only want to love something that loves you back. And this is a great opportunity for you to fall in love with fresh, sustainable, healthy, brain healthy fish. So e-fish.com. So Jeff, let's talk about uh, the healthiest fish that you have on the site. And one of the things we talked about at the break that surprises many people is that mackerel is actually loaded with omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah, so it, mackerel is one of those products where most people don't, they don't see it in their local market. They don't think to buy it. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, it does have a really strong flavor to it, right? So it's not for everybody, but it's packed and loaded with omega-3 fatty acids, which we all know and love. Um, it's double that of salmon and salmon is the poster child for omega threes. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, it's one of those things where you have an opportunity to eat lower on the food chain, which of course means that it's not going to have a lot of accumulated heavy metals, um, in addition to having those omega threes. Um, and so that's just an item that you, you really can't find elsewhere. And it's, it's one of those seasonal items during the summer that we're, we're super fortunate to be able to, to carry. And are they small fish? Yeah. So they're small. So they're, um, you know, a lot of people will say that it's, um, it's kind of like eating the food that the big fish would eat. Right. So it's, it's kind of, it's known for being a bait fish, right? It's similar to anchovies, similar to sardines. Mackerel is maybe this big in size, right. And they're, they're small and slender. Um, but that ultimately eating lower on the food chain is, is one of those things that we need to be able to do to support more healthy fisheries. Mm -hmm. prevent overfishing on uh, on some of these species that are that are more mainstream right we need to give them a break every now and again mm -hmm. what's and your favorite way to eat them 
Um, so a lot of people love to, uh, to grill this fish. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do is kind of, uh, you'll keep them whole. So it's a whole fish that you're going to cook. Um, and really you, uh, one way that our, one of my customers did that I absolutely loved and tried myself was you'll slice the meat, um, on the, on the fish and you'll slide little lemon wedges in between oh. and you throw it on the barbecue and get a nice char on it. And it's, it's really delicious. Oh yeah, I was going to say, sometimes when a fish is strong, either lemon or a little bit of vinegar can help too um, with the flavor. Yeah. So mackerel is a surprising fish. What else? Yeah. So it, and of course, like um, I like to think of things based on where the fish are. So on the West coast, um, we have some amazing fish that are packed with omega threes. Black cod is mm -hmm. one of the more notable ones. Um, you could also find it called sable fish or butterfish because it really is. That's what I, that's what I had from your, yeah. from, and it was that's great. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's what like Nobu made famous with his miso black cod yeah. um, packed with omega threes. Uh, we have ancho fresh anchovies and sardines like you would find when you're in Italy. Yeah. Uh, on I love sardines. Most people don't like them. Yeah. No, they, they're, they're fun. And you just have to, one of the things that I've learned um, being surrounded by more seafood is just take the experience for what it is. It's, it's a total culinary adventure. And that's what I love about it. Cause you can try different products. It's a ton of fun in the kitchen, um, versus cooking something like chicken where you have white meat and you have dark meat right. with fish. Like the opportunities are endless. Yeah. Believe it or not. One of the ways that I love the smaller fish like that is in egg, like breakfast in eggs. Like it's yeah. people are like, what? No, I promise you it tastes great. It's really good. So I grew up eating that kind of thing. Um, yeah. so like kippers and eggs and, you know, sardines and eggs, and it's actually really good. It's tasty. For a long time, I didn't like salmon. And then I found Copper River salmon out of Alaska. And for some reason, I guess the fat content's different love Copper River salmon. And it's just about ready to run now from, if, if I remember right, it's June, July. Yeah. Um, so why would different species of a fish taste significantly different? Yeah. So ultimately the way that I like to think of it, and you said this um, earlier today, what they eat and the environment that they're in really dictates the flavor profile of these fish. And so what I like to look at is where are these fish being caught? What time of year is it? What's the temperature like? What type of nutrients are in the water? Because that's going to largely affect the way that it tastes. Mm. So whether you're, it's actually really interesting um, when we look at products like scallops, right? Typically we're, we're selling sea scallops that are caught in, you know, out of Massachusetts or out of the Gulf of Maine. And those have one flavor profile. It's like ice cold water, nutrient rich, um, and just really clean water that it's coming out of. And so that has one flavor profile. Um, we've been getting scallops out of Scotland recently, which are also phenomenal, but what's amazing is it's the exact same species, but they taste very different because the nutrients in the water out on the coast of Europe is, is very different from the nutrients that are out in, in new England. So and that makes, that makes sense because when you think of like, even the difference between grass fed beef and bison, they're very different. So when you talk about bison, that is like wild bison or not like uh, free range, like truly free range. And you compare that. I used to do this in my classes when I would teach them, I would show a farm raised piece of beef next to a, free range piece of bison. One is a light pink and white because the white is the fat that's marbled all through it. And they're same cut like in New York. And yeah. then the bison is deep purple. There's like almost no fat in it and they've eaten completely differently and they've run. And so it's all muscle. You know yeah. what I mean? They taste totally different. Totally. So that makes total sense. It's all about the environment that you're in. Yeah. Well, and for there, it's the fat content right? as well. And fat content in fish also really matters. Um, what are some of the leanest fish compared to the fattier fish? Yeah. So some of the more lean fish that you're going to find, um, I mean, obviously if you're looking at 
you know, different cuts of tuna. Like um, if you're looking at a loin of tuna, there's going to be less fat in there. Um, and then as you look to more of the, the white fish or what we would call ground fish. Uh, so this is the cod, haddock, hake of the world, pollock. Um, those are all going to be a much leaner cut. Um, California halibut, for example, has very low fatty content. But if you get a halibut from Alaska or you get a halibut from Maine, those are going to have a, a much richer fatty content to it. And again, like you just have to think of where they're being raised, right? Or where they're living. And when you're in a really cold environment, how do you stay warm? Mm -hmm. Got to have that that fatty layer there. Yeah. Interesting. So interesting. Well, what we hope is that you will consume more fish because mm -hmm. it's good for your brain, but consume healthy fish. You always know, you want to know where it was raised, the environment, what the fish ate. Farm fish is not always a bad thing, but you want to really just try to be informed and understand to learn more about Jeff and Jeff's company, e-fish.com. You can use the discount code AMEN10. Love that. Uh, and, you know, it's good for you and it's good for our environment. So, Jeff, we're so proud of you and really so are. happy to have you on the Brain Warriors Way podcast. We look forward to just watching your mission grow. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This has been so much fun. Good to see you both. You too. All right. You're listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Stay with us. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're interested in coming to Amen Clinics, use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com. For more information, give us a call at 855 978 1363. 